Welcome and uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kathy J. Campbell and this is Coffee with Dr. CJ. This is our 15th webinar uh, that we started at the beginning of COVID. And we started it for a variety of reasons to understand a little more about COVID and learn about COVID. We wanted to learn how to bake bread with uh, very little <laughs> yeast and uh, flour. So we learned a bit about that. Uh, we wanted to find out how to exercise with our gyms closed. We wanted to learn more about dealing with stress and anxiety and mental health issues, which have become very large at, at this time. While we worry about our kids, our family, our loved ones, our finances, our work, and so forth. We also looked at parenting and all the issues around parenting. We learned new skills and all the new tasks expected of us from teaching our kids to, to working from home, to doing all the variety of tasks that we've never had to do one on top of the other uh, as much as recently. And uh, also wanted to uh, talk today about a safe return to school, because as we start sliding out of this pandemic, hopefully fingers and toes crossed, uh, how are we going to get the kids back in school? And uh, I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest in, in a minute. But first, I wanted to thank Cleveland Clinic Canada, who has been incredibly supportive. We have our offices in downtown and uh, midtown of beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We uh, also want to thank our executive team and the CEO, uh, Mike Kessel, who's an incredible leader and has been very supportive of all of us. And finally, I wanted to thank Sophie Frazier and Megan Guest, who have been incredible supports through uh, Cleveland Clinic Canada in supporting these webinars and helping us uh, uh, get the information together for you. So uh, lastly, I wanted to say that if you do have questions, and I know we've already had questions coming in, um, please go to the chat box and put your question in, and I will try to work it in during the conversation uh, or at the end. We have a little bit of time at the end as well that I will carefully uh, try to carve out here. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our special guest today, Dr. Amy Cheng. Hello. Uh, Hello. Dr. Amy Cheng is uh, a board certified physician in emergency medicine at uh, St. Michael's Hospital. And more importantly, she's a very busy mom with two young kids. Her clinical interests include quality improvement, health and safety, and wellness programming, and her training has been extensive with a Bachelor of Science from University of Toronto. She's done her MD and her medical residency in Toronto and an MBA, I believe it was in Spain, and also a program in clinical effectiveness at Harvard University. So um, most importantly today, she has extensively uh, researched the back to school issue due to her interest in medicine and safety, but also as a mom who wants the best for her family and her children. Uh, tell us today, Amy, first welcome, but tell us today, Amy, one positive thing that has come out of COVID for you and for your family. Uh, I've been asking all our guests this question. And uh, so what would you say about that? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I think um, it's always a privilege to be able to kind of share my um, experience personally, but as well as what I've been working on with, with everybody here. In terms of what, is, what has been positive that come out of COVID is, I think personally, just how to be more present with my kids. I think when everything shut down, um, we were spending so much time with the kids. <laughs> Whereas before we were so busy just driving them from here and there from school and all these activities. But you know, when there's no activities to go to, you have to, you have to hang out with your kids. And I remember the most memorable thing was they, they, we, we sprouted these bean seeds from just dried beans. 
And we saw them grow from little seedlings to little plants. And then I bought pots and I potted them in the backyard. And now they're, we've gone on to our fifth harvest. And the kids, this is one way to get your kids to eat vegetables. You get them to grow it themselves. Um, but it was incredible because I couldn't remember the last time I sprouted beans <laughs> or any seedlings ever. And just that process of taking the time and, um, and doing that with the kids and explaining to them, it was it was actually quite a miracle. It's, it's very special. I think that's something we're going to try to do year after year, um, just little gardening projects. So, you know, we've heard this about gardening, and, <laughs> and we almost did a webinar on gardening. Uh, it's very therapeutic. <laughs> uh, because a lot of parents have been doing that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just one second here, sorry. And there is lovely Amy. And um, so we're going to dive right into it. I know, as sure. I mentioned, there's lots of questions already. So school is right around the corner, Amy, and the landscape of COVID and return to sport and all the countries is different. Um, for instance, in Israel, they opened up in May uh, when the community prevalence was still kind of high. And mm -hmm. then they had a heat wave. They put the air conditioner on, closed all the windows. They allowed the kids because of the heat to take the masks off and all of a sudden there was a surge. So mm -hmm. I know that Israel and Germany have been having some problems and yet Finland and Switzerland, perhaps taking a little more care, have done it fairly successfully. So what is the fall going to look like uh, for us? Perhaps, you know, first in Ontario and then globally, if you care to, mm -hmm. to uh, answer that. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So I think there has been a lot of other countries that have opened schools, or in fact, some have never closed schools, um, even during the height of the pandemic. And I think there's been a lot of media interest that were focused on Israel, just because there was such a big outbreak after the school closed. But you have to keep in mind that there were countries that were actually quite successful. So Switzerland successfully opened their school. Um, Denmark successfully opened their school. Um, the key thing was that they opened school with a very, um, a very good plan to keep all the safeguards in place like PPE, distancing measures, but also they open schools when the community transmission is low. I, well, we'll talk about that in terms of actual numbers and what that means, I think, in a couple of um, slides later on. But, you know, just because there were um, dramatic increases in places like Israel or even outside of Atlanta, where we heard some case reports, it doesn't mean that all school openings will result in that negative consequence. I think, I think any kind of back to school plan has to be, um, there should be, it should be thoughtful and keep in mind the community transmission rate. Mm -hmm. In terms of what school will look like in the fall, well, just like anything else, business is not going to be as usual. The back to school this year is gonna look extremely different. Um, it really depends on where you are at, even across Canada, different provinces have different back to school plans, even within a province, different regions, whether you're urban or rural, it's going to look different. But generally, there's three basic models. There's the online only, where the whole curriculum will be delivered online, at least initially, such as in um, certain counties in California or in Florida, where their community transmission is, is so high that it, it's not safe to open schools in person. And then on the other side, there is the regular full-time back to school in person even then it's not gonna look different, right? As I mentioned before, there'll be certain safety measures that will take in place, maybe distancing, certain extracurricular, choir, singing, those things that are thought to be high risk for transmission will not be there. And then there'll be somewhere in between where we call it a hybrid model. I know in Ontario, they are doing the hybrid model in secondary schools. And what the hybrid means is that it's a mix where school will be fully open, but the class will be split um, in half or different segments. And certain kids will come to school in person, either all in the morning and then do online in the afternoon, 
or certain days like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they'll be in person. And then the other segments will come on Tuesday, Thursday. So it's a combination. Uh, you might have also heard about uh, the pandemic pods. So what that is, is a, it's a very small, almost niche type of programming where parents choose the online option, but they get together with a smaller number of families, either that are similar in ages to their kids or people that are already in their social bubble, and they hire a tutor or a teacher to guide the kids through part of the online curriculum for a few hours of the day. So those are the, the several options or the several uh, possibilities that you'll see coming in September. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that what you start off with might not be how it's going to continue. I mean, fingers crossed, the, the rates are gonna be still low and then we'll be con able to continue to do what we did in starting September or even maybe all the kids will be back to school in person. But if the transmissions are high again, we might go to online, we don't know. Um, or it might continue the way things are. It's just, it's just hard to predict at this point. Thank you. And, and how does COVID actually uh, affect children? Um, we hear a lot about COVID affecting the elderly and those with other medical issues mm -hmm. or comorbidities. Comor Some countries uh, feel that the kids should go back to school totally because they're at less risk of getting ill. Uh, is this true? How is COVID affecting the kids first off? How do they present? Uh, as an ER doc, I'm sure you've, yes. you've seen some of this. Uh, and then um, what, what are some of the features uh, of this for the parents and people out there? Okay, great, thank you very much. So this is actually one key question, right? One key question in ch parents' decision of how should we send our kids back to school? How is COVID gonna affect them? And the good news is kids are actually not that badly affected. Now keep in mind what we're talking about is healthy mm -hmm. kids with no underlying medical disorders. So if your child is healthy otherwise, um, children account for a minority of infections that we know about. Um, that being said, you know, we've only dealt with COVID since the beginning of the year. So our knowledge is still evolving, but we do, do know that of COVID um, tested positive patients who are symptomatic, children make up a minority of them. So five to 10% of COVID patients who are symptomatic are children. And even when they are tested positive for COVID, the vast majority of healthy children are asymptomatic or have minor symptoms. And what I mean by minor is kids do not require hospitalization. So they might have your typical COVID symptoms of runny nose, fever, cough, uh, difficulty breathing that does not require any medical intervention. Sometimes there are rare, rare symptoms such as diarrhea or abdominal pain. They might also get a rash. Um, the characteristic thing of COVID, although it's very rare, is loss of smell or taste. But generally, it can be as mild as a common cold. So COVID in kids are generally mild or asymptomatic, and they do affect the men children make up for a small percentage of COVID positive patients. That being said, the risk of COVID in kids is not zero. There's always a risk in medicine. We can never say there's zero risk, but it is much lower than in adults. Um, and there's been some studies that are emerging from South uh, Korea where we think that kids actually transmit COVID less than adults or older kids. And the cutoff tend to be around 10. So kids who are less than 10 years old actually transmit COVID less than adults or older children. Now, the caveat to all of this, even though it's a bit of a good news, the caveat is most of the information that we know about children are from studies that, take, that took place during the height of the pandemic. When most places were locked down, when most schools were locked down, when we reopen again and when schools reopen in much of the world in September, whether or not our understanding of COVID in children will change 
it's hard to say, but that's what we do know so far. Now, we mentioned about Israel and the heat wave, and we already mm -hmm. had a question, so I'm going to work it in here. Okay. Uh, so would a heat wave in late September, October be relevant here in Ontario? You mentioned Israel's heat wave, which caused a spike in transmission. So I think, I think that's a great question, and I think that's definitely a concern because the rates increased dramatically after that incident. I think that the, the thing to keep in mind is not so much the heat wave, is how much do we actually deviate from the protocols that decrease exactly. transmission, right? So what happened during, so we do know certain things, like for example, circulation is important. So part of the government's plan is to do outdoor teaching, outdoor activities as much as possible, um, keeping ventilation, opening the windows as much as possible, possible, social distancing the kids within a classroom and mask when possible. What and this happens, is, sorry, this is the Ontario government. Yeah, and right. in general, those are, generally, those are the, the measures that have taken around the world, particularly in places that have been successful. Um, mm -hmm. The heat wave issue with what happened in Israel is that when the heat wave came, many of those measures was, went out the window, essentially. Yeah, so what happened exactly. was, because it was so hot, they closed the windows, they couldn't go outside, they closed the windows to keep the AC on. So there was one point docked for uh, circulation. Masks were taken off. So that's another thing. And the class sizes were an issue to begin with. Um, they, they, the, because of the class sizes, they weren't really able to distance appropriately. So when you take into account indoor, uh, no outdoor ventilation, no masks, no social distancing, that seems to be the main drivers of what happened in Israel. Right. So uh, how do we make the decision as a parent mm -hmm. on whether your kids should physically go back to school or use other options? Um, some can't certainly afford some of the options you mentioned. You know, some aren't going to be able to afford a tutor and a little pod in the corner, <laughs> which is lovely. Uh, but uh, for the majority of people, they're kind of stuck with what you've suggested, even the online part. There's some homes that perhaps don't have the bandwidth or mm -hmm. whatever the term to even get some of the programming. So, so it, is, it is a difficult issue and it's pushing parents to get those kids back to school. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are some of the factors that parents uh, need to consider, and I've put up some examples here, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think the the most important thing that I look at as a parent and also as an Emerge Doc is you will just have to make the decision that is best for your family, that is best for your child, that is best for your really your situation at this point based on the best possible, um, I guess, evidence and information that you have. And keep in mind that you're never really going to fully know everything. I do this in the emergency room all the time. I have to make very quick decisions and you just have to stick with it. And you often don't know if that's really ultimately the best decision because you, you just don't have all the information right there. And I think it's apparent. It's even, I call it the parent guilt. because It's really, really tough. Um, to make any decision as a parent. And now I think during COVID, you have, to, you have to make decision as a parent, as a teacher, and sometimes as a medical professional, and also as a clin clinical epidemiologist. So it's really, really tough. So I think the first important factor you have to consider is one, is your child healthy, right? So if your child is healthy, like I was mentioning before, the risk of COVID in children, as far as we know, is still fairly low, especially if the kid is young, right? So they transmit less if they're less than 10 years old. The majority of them have mild to asymptomatic infection. However, if your child has underlying medical issues, um, and we know that children with underlying metabolic issues, congenital heart disease, um, certain instances, childhood obesity, those risks, those children are at an increased risk of having a more severe disease of COVID. 
as well as they're more likely to have complications of COVID. So, you know, how, how much of the risk are you willing to take and how sick will your child be should they contract COVID? That's one of the questions. And two, who lives in your household? If your child brings home COVID, um, are there elderly people in your household? Are there people at higher risk that they might become severely ill with COVID? So that should play in um, your decision. Secondly, um, what, what is the likelihood that they're going to get COVID in school? And a lot of it plays into, well, how many active cases of COVID is there in your community? So there are, it, it's hard to pinpoint on numbers, but luckily in this instance, there are some recommendations. So Harvard recommends school should open when there are less than 25 active cases per 100,000 people in the community. And the World Health Organization recommends that schools should safely open when the test positivity rate is less than 5%. So what does that actually mean? So in Canada, so in Ontario, for example, Ontario, our current active cases per 100,000 is nine. So we're well beyond, below that. Even the current hotspot of Alberta is 29 per 100,000 and BC is 21. So those are what we call the yellow zone. But in the test positivity rate, so WHO recommends less than 5% test positivity rate. Ontario currently is sitting at 0.4, so well below that. Um, Alberta is 1.5% and BC is 2.7. So, um, so in terms of those numbers, you should take into look into account of that. I know also several jurisdictions, several cities, also have interactive maps that tracks COVID cases in your particular section in your city. Because most public schools um, are organized by the community. So it doesn't really, so it gives you more information. So you can just Google it, look at the interactive sites and just kind of make a decision for yourself as to whether or not that risk is um, too high or, or uh, too low, well, never too low a risk, but whether that risk is manageable for your family. Well, that's great information. And what mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest is this information will go to all the people in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to suggest that uh, Sophie helps us along with you to get a couple of these sites, because as a parent, you know, if if I want to be less than 25 active cases per 100,000, I need to find that information somewhere. Yeah. And you've given it, and it's great, and it's good to know that. But, but let's put that on this, uh, sure. this website uh, or on the information so that we can uh, provide that to the audience as well. That's great information. OK. Um, so I guess the second important arena that you need to think about is what is happening at the school? Now, this is something that you cannot control, um, but it's good to know exactly what are some of the measures that are, are being undertaken to keep your children safe. Um, so most of the things that we've already are very much ingrained to our daily lives is, you know, social distancing. Um, do the school have space uh, to actually physically distance the children? If not, are there actually other measures? So some schools are talking about plexiglass between the kids, um, you know, sitting them two to a table instead of four individual desks. So some of the, those are some of the things that you need to look at. Masks is a hot topic, right? Even across different provinces, different counties, different countries, the mandatory rule of mask differs. It differs also between different age groups. So that's important to find out. And also um, things like we talked about outside classes. Are they going to be able to do that? Do they have the capacity to do that? And as well, um, certain uh, special courses. For example, music is going to look very different, right? We do know that indoor singing poses a risk because there's a projection of droplets. So are the kids going to still be doing singing? What are they going to be doing for music? there should not be sharing of, you know, banned instruments. And if there are, how are they going to disinfect it? 
for Z, it's going to look very different, right? Contact sports. We do know that there are certain risks um, associated with that. Um, but what will they be doing instead of Z? So things like that, uh, as a parent, it's good to find out from the school itself. And finally, how are your kids going to be going to and coming back from school? If they're going to public, taking public transportation, um, what are some of the policies regarding using public transportation? Or if they're using a designated school bus, how would they be distanced? Are they able to walk to school, bike to school? If you drive them, how is traffic going to look like? So some of those things, it might be important to find out ahead of time. Um, and finally, you know, the most important thing is the whole bubble and cohorting. I know some classes to reduce uh, transmission and risk, they're cohorting uh, the kids in school. But how would that look like outside of school, right? Can your kids still play with friends who are in different cohorts? What does that mean? Um, I mean, kids, ultimately, they're, they're still going to be kids. They want to see their friends that they've established, you know, friendship with. How, as a parent, what are some of the things that you can do to still ensure that they still develop those friendships, but still keeping them safe? So I think those are some of the, and finally, I think that's the thing that is the most important for every parent is logistically, how do I actually make it all work, right? Um, if you're able to work from home, uh, you know, if you have one kid in online, one kid in hybrid, like how is your work day going to work? Is there flexibility in your work schedule? If you have to be there in person, um, what would that mean if my kid is sick and I have to be at home? So those are just some of the questions that you might want to start your, asking your employers now. Um, you might not have all the, the questions or the answers, but at least, you know, my motto is always have plans, plans A, B, C, D, and plan it out as much as you can. There's going to be things that are going to be beyond your control, but at least for the things that are within your control, you can start thinking about what that is going to look like. Those are uh, great ideas, and especially for parents out there uh, with kids going back to school, to have that discussion ahead mm -hmm. of time with HR. Uh, mm -hmm. Some you know, human resource departments are going to be right on it, you know, and others, uh, not so much. And so now's the time to bring it up because everyone worries about job safety and, and etc. cetera. Um, uh, I did get a question and it kind of relates to what we were talking about. So I think I'll bring it up now. Okay. Uh, Ontario is well below the 25 cases per 100,000. Do you expect it to stay this low going forward through the school year? Tough question. <laughs> that is a tough question. I don't think I, I can answer that. <laughs> but that being said, I mean, you can even see when, when Ontario is uh, reporting their daily numbers. Last week, we were over 100, whereas the week before, we were less than 100. So you're going to see these daily oscillations, and hopefully, the trends will continue to decrease. Now, what I don't know what's going to look like when school starts, because if you think about it, it's like when we went into phase three and we start opening bars and we started allowing indoor gatherings, we started allowing gatherings of up to a hundred people. The idea is that when you have more people congregating together, like schools, infections are expected to go up. It's just inevitable. So I think, I think this is only my own personal opinion. Um, when we have schools opening, the I think the rates will go up, whether or not it'll just sustain, kind of like what we see right now and then peter off, or whether it'll continue to increase. It will all depends on a lot of the things that we're being asked to do every day already, right? Mm -hmm. Stay home from work if you're sick. Keep your children at home if they're sick making sure you're hand washing, making sure you're practicing social distancing, all of that stuff, which plays a big role in transmission, have, that have kept our rates low despite going into phase three, will probably be needed to be, um, it's more important when we go forward when the schools open. But I have no idea how to answer that question because I don't know. Well, there are certain countries that we can learn from. You know, Switzerland, we talked about earlier. They opened their school several months earlier. 
and they saw after school opening, the, the rates of community um, of active cases have increased slightly, and then they've kind of plateaued. They've recently had another increase of cases. How much of that can be contributed to school or just people gathering? It's hard to know, um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be able to keep this manageable. And I would just say, don't underestimate the value of your opinion. Uh, not, only, <laughs> not only are you seeing all of these uh, situations in the ER, but being a mom and researching it and so forth, you can't read this stuff in the New England Journal, or, no. or not, not, not so much yet. So we all value uh, your opinion. It's an educated opinion, and, uh, and we thank you for that. I have another uh, question here now that we're, we're on the, the school issue is, is if school is in session with protocols, then is it safe, smart to allow children to also resume dance class or out of school care, mm -hmm. etc. And I would think it goes back to the same issues about yeah. distancing about, but mm -hmm. go ahead. I think that's, uh, I think that's, that's a really important question um, and I think it's it's a really difficult question because I think at the end of the day there are two issues to how important is that particular activity to your child and to your family how risky is that particular activity and you know what are some of the safeguard precautions that the particular institution is taking place so, you know, if your kid is in choir and you live in the northern climate where the majority of the time the choir practice will be indoors, it's probably a higher risk for transmission of disease um, in an activity that might not be as essential as, you know, school um, than some other activity. So that's something that you need to um, think about carefully as a parent and as a family. Um, you know, martial arts where there is contact and it's indoor, you know, that might not be as safe. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you are now also increasing your bubble, right? So in school, your, your kids' bubble are gonna be, uh, you know, a certain size depending on the school. And once they're involved in one, two, three extracurricular activities, that bubble has increased exponentially. Yeah. Um, as a mom, that's something I've been thinking about. I'm like, oh, do I, does the kids need to go back to piano? Can they go back to swimming? I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about it yet because I want to make sure one that they they at least go back to school and everybody's safe first. And then I think what I'll do is I'll introduce the other activities in one by one. Um, but if those activities are really meaningful to your kids, um, then it's something that you need to consider. And you know. Don't, don't be afraid to really ask about the policies from those institutions about what it is that they're doing to keep your kids and other kids safe. So I know um, that you're all over preparation, Amy. Yes. I know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, she is an organized mom. Uh, so how, uh, we're gonna go through a number of things. First, I'm gonna yeah. ask you about how you help your child prepare for going back to school. And then how do you prepare your household uh, but let's start with how you prepare your child for this going back to school. And perhaps you could speak uh, how old your kids are and, mm -hmm. and what sex. So my kids are five and three. And so the five is going to SK and the three is going to like a preschool in the same school. Um, he was a Montessori last year. So they're used to the school environment. Um, the new rules are kind of strange because kids like to hug other kids and they like to you know, they just get into all each other and just kids by nature, they're just, not, hand hygiene is not their forte. So <laughs> when COVID hit, I think the school was good in the sense that they taught them how to wash their hands and now we have to remind them, but still, you know, I tell my little guy, you know, just running your hand through the water is not washing your hands. So I have to teach them how to do it the big boy hand washing where you have to wash <laughs> with your soap appropriately. So, you know, if your kids are small, you, you tell them that's how big boys or big girls do and it seems to stick. Um, but I think we've been in the uh, pandemic long enough that at least the kids just know that there are certain things that they're not supposed to do. Um, it, it breaks my heart still that they say, you know, we can't hug so-and-so because, you know, COVID mom, COVID. 
Um, but, you know, you just kind of have to reinforce those certain things. Um, at home, I have to constantly remind them before they eat, after they eat, after the bathroom, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. We're getting there. Uh, <laughs> masks, I was surprised by masks. So in anticipation of back to school, and also, you know, I've been bringing them inside to certain things. Um, they have to wear their mask now. Initially, I didn't think the kids will wear masks, um, especially my little guy. But I've, I've been surprised. Um, we went to the mall the other day, and, you know, my, my three-year-old, my five-year-old's like, where's my mask, mom? I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's your mask. Um, and they kept it on for the most part. So I was, I was surprised. Um, so I think it's just this constant reinforcing. I think a lot of parents are anxious about how do we keep a mask on, um, particularly the younger kids where they just want to rip it off their face. And I think my own personal experience, certain things that's worked is the fit is very important. So I find that when you buy a mask, there's, there's the elastic, but then there's also certain masks where there's an adjustment piece. So you can actually adjust the elastic to actually fit on your child's face. Um, so find those ones, let them pick the pattern, right? It's very important. <laughs> I found that, you know, if like anything, right? Make, let, let them pick their own water bottle, let them take, pick their own mask. Like they, they are more likely to keep it on. Um, and, uh, so that's, so the mask and hand washing for me was the biggest thing about preparing them from school. In terms of the other question, you know, how are we preparing now? So um, personally, I'm sending both my kids back uh, in person. Um, a lot of what I'm doing now to prepare them and the household is something that I learned from the beginning of the epidemic when I was preparing myself to work. So as, Kath, as you know, Dr. Campbell mentioned, I work in downtown Toronto, I work in the emergency department. And when this first hit, it was actually very scary to go to work. Um, I can't control what's gonna walk into my door. I can't control how sick somebody is, but what I quickly learned is I can control how much I can prepare, but I can, what I was more worried about is if I was gonna bring this home. So there were certain things that I can do to prepare myself so that I don't bring it home. So what I did is, there you go, there's the checklist. So I love checklists. Um, so what I did is I had a pre-work checklist and a coming home from work checklist. Um, so I'm gonna adapt this to before going to school, leaving the house checklist and after coming back from school immediately after checklist. And so some of the things that I'm gonna put on my before school checklist are things that are actually important in terms of screening your kids for symptoms, particularly the older ones. They're not, they might not tell you. So um, I know certain schools ask the parents to take the temperature. So one, does everybody, anybody have a fever? So, you know, check, no. Um, does anybody have, is everybody feeling okay? Anybody have a sore throat? Anybody have a runny nose that is not explained by usual stuff like allergies? Anybody have a cough? No, great, check. It, it, it did everybody taste their breakfast, right? So we talked about one of the characteristic things of COVID is that you can't taste it. Well, if they can't taste their, taste their breakfast, that's a problem. So those are kind of the health screening questions that should really uh, alert you to keeping your child at home. Second thing, more things that they need at school. So does everybody have their mask? Does everybody have a second mask? Because kids are gonna get it dirty, right? Is it in their bag? Do they have their water bottle? So a lot of the school's water, uh, water fountains are not gonna be in use and they're asking people to uh, bring a water bottle. So make sure your kids have one, if not two water bottles in their bag. Um, what are some other things? If you're, if you're gonna send your kids to school with hand sanitizer, we don't really recommend it for the really, really young kids because they might eat it. <laughs> but for the older kids, you know, do they have that? Um, so that would be like the before school checklist. Um, and then the immediately coming home, return to, return to home checklist will be, everybody needs to wash their hands with soap. Everybody should remove their clothes from school or any clothes or masks that they used at school and that should go into the washer immediately. Um, that's also what I did from work. Um, uh, water bottles, lunch boxes, anything that it was used and can be washed goes into the dishwasher or should be washed immediately. 
Um, anything that can be wiped down, wipe down, spray it, wash it. Um, and what I do, and I'm a little bit preoccupied with this, is I always take a shower when I come home from work. Um, whether or not you choose to do that with your children, that's totally up to you. I can totally see the chaos <laughs> that would happen if you have multiple children, but that's something that can go on your checklist as well. So I find that, you know, for the first month when I used this checklist at work, it was quite stressful. Like obviously mine looks very different than one of the school checklists, but after a while it became second nature. Um, and it just helped me regain some sense of control in a situation where there was a lot of things that I can't control. And Amy, we had a request uh, about mm -hmm. what temperature cutoff do you yeah. use uh, for the kids? I think it's standard for yeah. kids and adults. Yeah. To... So 38.0 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, I guess it's time to buy a thermometer if you haven't done it already. I haven't done it, but Keep in mind what happened last time with flour and yeast and toilet paper. <laughs> Maybe there'll be a run on thermometers. <laughs> I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, we're, uh, and you talked a little bit about uh, wearing a mask already. Um, so how can parents uh, mitigate risk? And we've talked about some of these things. Um, you... Uh, I know many activities today in this regard are divided really into low, medium, and high risk. And perhaps you could discuss using this format, which you've kind of touched on it already. Um, and we can also take questions from the audience here uh, as well. I think people have been sending questions in. So, perfect. Um, More questions, the better. <laughs> so, I, I think. You know, there's all of this stuff that's on the slide ultimately comes down to what are the activities and behaviors associated with those activities that you can safely social distance, right? So, and how much of it is logistically feasible for you and your family? If you cannot drive your kids to school, and I can't, and they have to use some kind of bus or public transportation, well, what are some of the things that you can do to mitigate those risks and what are the things that are already being done? So I know some of the school bus companies are talking about um, instead of two or three kids per row, they're doing one per row um, and all the kids need to wear the mask on the bus. Well, if that's your only option, then make sure that you know, your kids are washing their hands, make sure they keep their mask on, make sure they don't go on the bus when, you know, when they're sick. Um, but if you have the option, if the, if the children have the option to, you know, walk to school or bike to school or go in a private car, that's better. Lockers, I know at least in Ontario, there will be no locker space um, that will happen this year. And just because you can imagine that's where everybody congregates, that's where everybody socializes, and that is not in keeping with appropriate social distancing. Lunch is also going to look very different. Um, certain schools are talking about staggering lunchtime so that you eat lunch with your cohort. Um, and, you know, a lot of places are talking about lunch outside whenever possible. So all of these activities are still talking about the same social distancing measures, right? Appropriate ventilation, keeping your distance, don't congregate in groups. Um, and same thing with sports. I know there are a lot of schools are no longer having extracurricular sports, which is unfortunate. I think a lot of kids who I've, you know, there's a lot of benefit with extracurricular sports and I hope eventually we will get to a stage in the pandemic where these will um, return. Um, but certain, certain schools are talking about there's no competitive sports just because it's hard to bubble. Um, there probably won't be contact sports gameplay but there'll probably still be sports specific practice, which is at least good for team spirit and keeping up you know, with the physical activity. Though that's something that you should ask your school about and particularly, I guess, the coach about with that if your kids are in sports. Music we talked about, that's a challenging one. Uh, the singing indoors, we learned from the choir in Seattle early on the pandemic that it really seeped because of the, the droplet. Um, so choir indoors is quite risky, but, you know, schools are talking about still going ahead with music, 
whether it be playing instruments that do not require contact, not sharing instrument, um, doing more music theory and music history earlier on as we adapt to this um, uh, new situation. Now, so, Amy, we're, we're almost at an yeah. end here. Uh, we're a little over time. And okay. I'm going to hammer you with this last thing because yes. I know everyone is curious. So we'll, yes. I know it's going to be a very short answer. Uh, it's actually a long answer, but, uh, you know, we all know cold and flu season is coming. And yep. everyone is like, how do we know the difference? You know, my child has a sniffle. Do I send them to school? Is it COVID? Uh, as a mom and as an ER doc, what do you, I know it's probably two different answers, but, uh, but what, what do you suggest to the audience? So the, the one liner is that you can't tell the difference. Yeah. As an eMERGE doc, as a mom, I can't tell the difference, which is hard. So really the, the, the three line answer would be one, everybody needs to stay home when you're sick because you can't tell the difference. Two, um, the whole question with the sniffles, I mean, kids can have COVID and have the sniffles, but kids also have seasonal allergies and have the sniffles. Kids can have post-nasal drip and have the sniffles. So as a parent, it's really up to you to decide, well, they always have allergies this time of the year. This seems like they're allergies, so that's probably it or whether or not this actually deviates from their norm. And finally, I think the question that everybody wants to know is like, who should get tested, right? Um, as an ER doc, and I think when you're looking at population health is kids can be asymptomatic, they ha can have very mild disease and yet have COVID. And when they have COVID, they can transmit it to others who might not be so mild and asymptomatic. In fact, they can transmit it to the grandparents and they can get extremely sick. So everybody should get tested, right? As our premier said, if you think you might have COVID, you should get tested. I, we used to be very stringent on our tests in the ER earlier in the epidemic because we didn't have capacity. But now that we have capacity, if you think you or your child have COVID, you should get tested tested. You don't have to go to the ER. You don't have to go to your family doctor. You can get to a lot of these um, COVID assessment centers and they're everywhere. They're usually near a hospital or a clinic and you can go online and, and um, uh, see where they are. The important thing is if you think your child is really ill, bring them to the eMERGE or bring them to your pediatrician or family doctor. I'll leave that up to you as a parent. Um, but if they have, you know, if they're fairly mild and, you know, if it wasn't during the pandemic, you've been like, well, oh, that's nothing. Um, that's somebody that can go to the assessment center. Keep in mind that everybody who staffs the assessment centers are health professionals, whether they're nurses or physicians. So if they think based on their assessment of your child, they need more higher level of care, like to be assessed in the emergency department, they will send them to the emergency department. So you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But if right from the get go, you think your child is really sick, they should be seen by you know, a doctor right away, then you should bring them to whatever facility that you, you think is appropriate. Thank you so much. I know we've run over a bit. We yes. still have a couple more questions. No so I'm gonna ask Sophie to, to uh, take those questions and see if we can get a response on those and we can send them out with, the, uh, with this package that goes to all the audience people. So thank you so much, Amy. We really appreciated you coming on and answering some of these questions. And uh, good luck uh, with your own kids going yeah. back to school. So thank you. thank you very much. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Great.